Hello class, in light of recent events, I've prepared some remarks to share with you in connection to this week's reading of W.E.B. Du Bois. So dawned the time of Sturm and Drang. Storm and stress today rocks our little boat on the mad waters of the world sea. There is within and without the sound of conflict, the burning of body and rending of soul. So writes W.E.B. Du Bois in the first chapter of our spiritual strivings of his seminal 1903 work, The Souls of Black Folk. And even though this was written nearly 100 years ago, I think it captures our present historical moment perfectly. Without a doubt, we're in a moment of crisis. We're facing the worst viral pandemic in a century. There are 100,000 dead in the US alone. Nearly 40 million Americans are out of work. There's the ongoing murder of black people at the hands of police. And now we're seeing the most acute and pervasive social upheaval since the 1960s. And these issues are not unrelated. As we know, black Americans are dying of COVID-19 at three times the rate of white people. Now this is a question we've posed at different times through the course, but how can philosophy illuminate or make sense of this exploding dumpster fire that is our world? And I would include as philosophers, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., James Baldwin, Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, whom I'll mention again shortly. But the German philosopher Hegel famously remarked that the owl of Minerva spreads its wings at dusk, meaning perhaps that philosophical clarity always arrives too late at the end of the epoch it desires to bring into consciousness. Philosophical truth seems to require reflective distance. But crisis works precisely by accelerating this process of distancing, tearing a hole in the fabric of the present. The word crisis derives etymologically from the same source as the words certain, certainty, uncertain. The Proto-Indo-European root krei means literally to sieve, that is to distinguish or to discriminate between things. And so, we can interpret the word crisis in common English usage, perhaps, to mean the turning point at which it is certain that things are uncertain. And we're at that moment right now. In crisis, the familiar is made strange. And our own entanglement with and dependency on a familiar that is actively under erasure becomes a source of urgency. We must think together in and through crisis, recognizing it as a crisis, as the greatest emergency or exigency of thought. And philosophy can at least prepare the ground for a fresh interpretation of the world. And this is, I would say, especially its task in moments of crisis where the future remains uncertain. Now, given that the present is shaped in myriad ways by our projecting into a future, Philosophy can take hold of this uncertainty, embracing it as operative and definitive, rather than pushing it away or inoculating it through um, a dumb insistence on the very received or ready-made categories that are falling apart. We prepare the ground by reaching back into the past, that is our more or less obscure, uh, the more or less obscure or unclear origin of our unclear present, we reach back into the past for those threads that are now loosened up in crisis, gaining a view of their historical emergence in previous crises, which are at the same time different from and identical to the one that's currently facing us. <clears throat> and this is to make our suffering and confusion a recovery of a suffering and confusion that is not simply our own, uh, in the face of which makes us strangers to ourselves and makes strangers familiar. The present is obscure, but there are these openings in our intellectual past that can serve as windows onto the obscurity of the now, even if that framing by no means dissolves the obscurity, but only orients us or reorients us to it in a way that maybe allows us to take it more seriously. And we have to ask, what are 
the differential conditions that lead systemically to different outcomes for whites and for people of color. Now to point out that racism is invisible, operating in the background like the air we breathe seems like a tired cliche until you recall the last words of George Floyd echoing those of Michael Brown and Ferguson. I can't breathe. We're not seeing here anomalies in an otherwise rational system. These are not isolated instances of breakdown or disruption of, of, of our system or the structures. The complete and utter normalcy of the excruciating and protracted murder of George Floyd is clear, clearly demonstrated by the facts. That in broad daylight, a man was able to press his neck into his knee into another man's neck for nearly nine minutes, while three others participated and watched, all ignoring the desperate pleas of the victim and onlookers. That's a testament to just how normal this police-citizen interaction was, to put it euphemistically. The breakdown of normalcy here is not the event, but the events being filmed. Ahmaud Arbery was shot to death jogging in broad daylight, and the only reason the perpetrators were eventually arrested is because their friend released a video of the act, which was apparently so normal that he actually expected it to vindicate the killers. And this time of profound upheaval is only a shaking of the veil, as Du Bois describes it, concealing the color line that separates the white and black worlds. But the real breakdown is lived every day by people of color in wildly diverse and unseen ways. Racism is not simply the air they breathe, but the fumes that choke them. And we're talking about a long persisting social infection that has gone unrecognized and so untreated. And the painful eruptions and symptoms of this infection are being addressed by white society as the real disturbance, riots or protests or looting, for example, rather than as the necessary expression of a disease that has no other pathway open to it. So Du Bois, an early 20th century sociologist, historian, civil rights activist, writer, philosopher, is now seen as a forerunner to black existentialism. And especially with his story published in 1920, the comment, also a forerunner to the literary movement known as Afrofuturism, or black speculative fiction. He was the first African-American to obtain a doctoral degree from Harvard University, and he helped co-found the NAACP in 1909. In The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois seeks to foreground this veil separating the white and black worlds. And the question with which he begins the effort is, how does it feel to be a problem? It is, he says, a strange experience. Now in posing this question, how does it feel to be a problem? Du Bois isn't asking, how does it feel to have a problem? Nor is he identifying himself as the cause or origin of a problem for which he would then take on blame or guilt. Rather, his black body, his very existence, is a moving place where and through which the problem of race manifests. And because whiteness is the norm, constituting the very habitus, um, what social theorists call the habitus, that is the socially entrenched orientations and habits that are sedimented in our private and public spaces and institutions, a black body can present itself as either hypervisible or invisible. In short, a problem. Hypervisible, as in the innumerable instances now of white women calling the police on black people for seeming out of place, um, such as the black student at Yale in 2018 napping in her dorm's common area. Or to use a different example, one of, when one of my grad school advisors at the University of Kentucky, Arnold Farr, was mistaken for a janitor. Invisible, as when black bodies disappear into the various roles associated with the help. But this strange experience, Du Bois tells us, endows black Americans with a kind of second sight. Second sight, that's really important and we'll come back to that. And he characterizes the second sight as a double consciousness. On page five, 
is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Now this double consciousness is not the trivial condition of having or being multiple identities. I, for example, identify as a man, an American, a philosopher, a teacher, an artist, a veteran, a professor, etc. And none of these identities are in fundamental tension with one another. But in double consciousness, by contrast, one's basic consciousness of self is fractured, it's bifurcated into two essentially unreconcilable sources of being. In this case, on the one hand, American, with all its associated ideals of freedom and self-determination and equality, and on the other hand, Black, the social other, the problem that belies those abstract ideals in the material historical fact of ongoing Black oppression. And this, by the way, is the thinking behind Black Lives Matter. The fact of racial marginalization, oppression, and disparity demonstrates in a performative way the pernicious falsity of that ideal, all lives matter, actually showing it to be um, a false and regressive universalism that covers over uh, a state of affairs that is anything but universal. And there's a tension. Both of these sources of being have desirable qualities for Du Bois. Um, and this is why he says he wouldn't want to Africanize America or to bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism. Now this double consciousness, Du Bois tells us, prevents one from achieving true self-consciousness, which presupposes a kind of unity. Consequently, the now emancipated Black man, both free and unfree, following the ratification of the 13th Amendment, he's thrust into hesitancy and doubt, a kind of powerlessness or impotence. But here, Du Bois offers a profound insight that I think is often overlooked. The powerlessness looks like weakness, but it is not. It is rather the contradiction of double aims, a contradiction set up and sustained by societal conditions that shape and determine one's subjectivity. That is, one's orientation to and ways of inhabiting and navigating the world. And to say this is not weakness is to call it a strength, albeit a strength that's unintelligible from the point of view of dominant institutional power. It's a strength, and this is important, not in spite of, but in virtue of powerlessness. It's a strength made possible by the radical difference of double consciousness, exemplifying the ways in which the oppressed, the marginalized, and the alienated have greater access to the hard truths of reality than do the oppressors, the privileged, and the comfortable. And this is why Du Bois calls double consciousness, although a source of trauma, a second sight. Social contradiction becomes the ground for a peculiar lived existence which has its own incalculable strength precisely in its being outside of power as the contestation or refusal of that power. As the poet and scholar Audre Lorde puts it beautifully, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Now maybe under the weight of these crises that pile on top of each other, compounding, you find yourself in a kind of paralysis at a loss for what to do or say. Now I would say, listen to black people, adopt an explicit attitude of anti-racism rather than simply being not racist. As Angela Davis and others argue, in a society as racist as ours is, non-racism is, is effectively racism. But perhaps beyond listening and actively caring, you can only stammer inarticulately at the horror of suffering and death and loss and uncertainty. But know that the stammering and silence 
are more eloquent and they hew closer to the truth than do the efforts to flee the trouble by whitewashing events or clinging to the problematic assumptions that are unraveling before our eyes. In Du Bois's story, The Comet, it ends with this kind of profound silence, exploring the potentially transformative promise of catastrophe and apocalypse in a way that gives no easy answers or happy endings. 